know in Ireland most people had some class of religion and even if they hadn't got religion, they used to put down that they had religion. And now it's a sort of a mark of honour for people to put down to say they haven't got any religion whatsoever. But I don't know how many people here know that you're all very close to going to hell. <laughs> and I can see some of you don't believe me. If you like, in a while when we're finished, I'll bring you around the corner and I'll bring you to hell. How about that? That's a fair enough offer, is it? Because around the corner from here, many, many years ago, there was a place called hell. And just behind Christ Church Cathedral, there's a lane by a cobble lane by there now. And it was said that that was the entrance to hell. And over it, there was an oak carving of the devil. And the reason for it was this, that Christ Church was there with all its religious connotations. And beside it was the four courts. Now, we know the four courts where it is, where it is now across the river. And we have an even newer court system up beside Phoenix Park. And all of the legal shenanigans were done up here around the corner and there was living quarters there and there was working quarters there. And if you read the official histories, there was a great buzz of activity during the day. But Irish Dublin people will tell you there was another activity went on at night when people came along to offer other services that were normally found on the far side of the river in Monto, which is a red light district. But when the courts were finished, apparently they used to go up there. I don't know, I wasn't there. And it was called hell for all sorts of reasons. But the old carving was taken down and it was used, it was recycled before they invented the word. And it was made into other things. And some of the things that it was made, some of the uses it was put to was in making oak snuff boxes. So it's quite possible that whichever of you is carrying snuff with them today in a box are carrying a bit of hell around with you in your pocket. But there's no use in saying you have a look now because you're not allowed to smoke nor drink or take snuff in here tonight. So you'll have to wait till you go back outside the hell to see what it is you have in your pocket. So when the four courts were there, all sorts of people were brought in. And in a couple of years before the rebellion, a fellow was brought in and his name was William Jackson and he was a reverend. And he was from up the country and he had gone off and he went, he trained up and he became a reverend and then he found there was no money in that. So he decided then he would become what they used to call a partisan writer. And nowadays we'd call them a spin doctor Saving your presence, if any of you are in PR, that's what you are. As a partisan writer, you just write whatever it is the client needs to have written. So he did that sort of stuff, and he rattled around the place. And he was involved in the shenanigans in London, where himself and another fellow put on a play. And with echoes in modern times, films were made about the same principle. They got in more investors than could ever make a few bob out of it. And then they closed the show and that was it. And they didn't get back any money because they said they lost the whole lot. It was a bubble. But they were chased here and there. So he he found himself in France and he suddenly became a revolutionary in revolutionary France. And he became a spy for the French. And so he came back to Ireland to meet Wolf Tone and the United Irishmen who were planning a rebellion. That was eventually to lead the 1798 rebellion, a failed rebellion, if you're not from this part of the world. And he came through London and he met an acquaintance of his called John Cocaine, who was a lawyer. Which just brings it into the story, twice into the story, but it doesn't make any difference. He was a lawyer anyway. But so he confided in him what he was doing. And Cocaine talked to him and encouraged him to tell everything. And he did, told it understandably to his friend, but his friend did not share his political belief and as soon as possible he went off to the Prime Minister who was William Pitt, the younger at the time, to tell him. So he persuaded Cocaine to travel to Dublin with uh, Jackson to meet the, uh, to hear all about the United Irishmen. So you talk about spies and strange things that happen. He was a spy, but when he got all the information, he put it in the post and he, he, he posted it to France. Did you ever hear the likes of it in your life? Uh, and so, of course, they opened, the authorities opened up the envelope, and there you are, you're caught. And he was brought in, he was charged with treason, 
found guilty and he was to be sentenced. In or around 1795, he was to be sentenced and it was going to be, was going to be death. Because in those days, there was no such thing as rehabilitation or anything like that, you know. You were just, you were either flogged, deported or hanged and that was more or less it, you see. Before that, the, where the, the new court building is, the city gallows used to stand outside what is Phoenix Park now. And in or around 1662, when they started to assemble the lands that became Phoenix Park, they moved that gallows up to Kilmainham, where it was then moved into uh, the complex of Kilmainham Jail. But so he didn't know what was going to happen, and his two, his two uh, lawyers were fighting for his, for, to prevent him being sentenced to be hanged anyway. And uh, they weren't having much of it. The fellow, the judge was Lord Clonmel, and all he had to do this day was to sentence him to death, and that'd be it. That was all he had to do. He was already found guilty. And he was there, and they were arguing away, trying to get him not hanged, basically. However, it was observed, we are told, by an astute observer of life, that when the accused came in and sat in the dock and took off his three-cornered hat, his head was on fire. And there was smoke coming out of his wig. Or it was steam. We don't know. One or the other was coming out. And his, his lawyer said, you know, he's not, the man's not doing too well. Would you ever adjourn the, the case to be, to be seeing why his head is on fire? And I said, no, no. So Clon Mel was mad keen on hanging him. That was it. And he said, they eventually said, well, bring him a chair and let him sit down. So they brought the chair and they let him sit down. And Clon Mel was going on. And then somebody else said, he doesn't look well. He doesn't look well. I said, they had a look at him. And he was insensible. That's the word they used. Insensible. Which meant he could hear nothing. So he was sitting there. So then this lawyer started arguing and said, well, we should have a remand. If he can't hear, you can't sentence him to death. And he's insensible. So they were arguing as they do, back and forth and back and forth. It's at different times, I'm not half joking. One of the jurors says, I'll have a look and I'll see if he's all right. So he did. So he got up to have a look and he went over and Clamel says, well, and he says, I think he's dying. I don't, you know, and he says, well, can he hear the sentence? He said, I don't think so. So he said, right. Now, wouldn't you think that was enough? Your man comes out and he said, and, and the judge says to him, Clamel says to him, are you anything now that you would know a man was dying? I sure could ask if he was dying. Would you know he was dying? He says, I'm an apothecary. And he says, do you know what an apothecary is? Some people know, some people don't. It's a chemist now. He was licensed by a London organisation of um, apothecaries to prescribe, prepare and sell drugs, is the way they described it. And so Clamel still wouldn't believe him, so he had him sworn in so that he'd tell the truth. I don't know where the argument was, but I'd tell him. So he went over, and he says, well, what do you think? He says, I don't think, I think he's virgin on extinction. I, I don't, think, don't think he can hear anything. So then Clamel said, well, all right. He says, I'll adjourn the hearing on account of he can't hear, so it would be... It would be the fairest thing to do just to, you know, we'll, we'll adjourn it. So the other lads were happy then that were defending him. He said, fair enough, that's okay. But just as they were going out, and Clan Mel got up and he was going out, the sheriff was there, and the sheriff says, excuse me. And he said, what? He says, this man is dead. <laughs> and they looked at him and he was dead. And Clan Mel was very cross. Because he wanted to get him hanged. He didn't want him <laughs> to die before he hanged him. And he said, well, right, he said. We'll have an inquest, says Clonmel. And he started to go out again. And the sheriff says to him, excuse me, what am I supposed to do with the body while we're waiting for the inquest? And Clonmel says, do whatever you normally do under the circumstances. Now, whatever you normally do, I don't know. I haven't come across too many stories about people actually dying in a dock with their head on fire. <laughs> and Clan Mel says, do whatever you normally do. So he said, all right. So he left them there. 
And so he was dead in the dock for a day <laughs> until they came in the next day and they had the inquest. And they, they did whatever you do in the inquest. And they discovered that he had taken uh, poison, a metallic poison. And nowadays, people would say it was arsenic he took. But the clue was in the, in the, in the early morning because... Very strange way of going on. The poorer classes would be taken out to Parkgate Street and hanged straight away. But he was charged with treason and he used to stay at home with his wife. And he had the breakfast that morning. And as he came in the carriage over to the courts, they said that he was leaning out of the carriage and that he was thrown up as he came across the bridge. And that was a certain clue that something had happened. So they had a, an autopsy or an inquest and they said that was it. And they decided that he had taken his own life. But... The strange twist of it, his wife was not proceeded against, although they thought that it was her, had given it to him, her, you know, helped him, not killed him, helped him. And uh, because if they had found him guilty of treason, all his uh, estates would have been seized. And if he died by any other means, then it meant that his family inherited whatever he had from the French and everything else. And so they left it at that. And he was taken away and he was buried Cross the river, you can go over any time you like now and have a look up at St. Micken's Church. He's buried up there, along with all of the, the other preserved bodies, Crusaders and the Shears brothers and everybody else. And they buried Oliver Bond up there as well. And Oliver Bond was, was represented by the same two lawyers that, prevent, that was trying to prevent him being hanged while Clon Mel was trying to hang him and he was trying to kill himself. Can you imagine what sort of a court was that? But he's up there now, and he's gone, Oliver Bond is gone, and Wolf Town's gone, and they're all gone. And what difference did it make to anybody? But we can only hope in conclusion that wherever they are, the sight of a head on fire is not such an unusual thing to see. <laughs> Thank you.